Takže si poví. Okay. Hi everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, first infrastructure call we have. Um, yeah, this is the first time we do this to try and align basically uh, the different tooling layers and infrastructure layers uh, with the work that we're doing at the protocol level. Um, yeah, Trent has set, set this up. I don't know if you want to give a quick overview, Trent, of like, yeah, how, how yeah, we got sure. here. Sure. So um, we wanted to just start early and we know there's a, there's a lot of complexities with um, ecosystem tooling and libraries that need to adapt for 1559. So we just wanted to start this process early instead of having everybody, you know, try to figure it out on their own. So this call will be, um, like Tim said, an experiment. We're trying to get people to just have a quick synchronous discussion um, and hopefully we'll iron out some issues uh, together and come to consensus on what things should be. Um, I know I've, I think I spoke to almost everybody who's on the call. so. Hopefully my intro to what this project is, is um, sufficient. But if you have any questions, feel free to reach out um, either on Discord or Twitter, Telegram, whatever works, and I can answer any questions. But yeah, so we're, uh, th th this is the, a one-off for now. Um, we're not planning to have this every two weeks or anything, um, but we'll see you know, what the need is going forward after this call. Um, I dropped the agenda in the chat. So if you'd like to see that, it's, it's pretty short. Uh, so we have a lot of leeway on what we can actually discuss. Main topics are going to be JSON RPC. And um, I think there was another one that I added recently. But yeah, uh, if there's any initial questions, otherwise, we can probably just get started with discussion on JSON RPC. Um, yeah, actually, I, I guess uh, just there were like, yeah, three things on the agenda. Uh, so there's just an RPC, just getting general updates from the projects, which we can probably do at the end. And then also the change between gas target and gas limit. Um, it might make sense to start by the last one, uh, just because this is one that'll change kind of the consensus rules. And we want to make sure, uh, yeah, that's kind of agreed upon. Uh, yeah. And yeah, then I think, I've, yeah. I was just going to say, you reminded me, I should probably mention the tracker. So. The, the other component to this, in addition to the call to this uh, London readiness or London infra readiness initiative uh, is that there's a tracker that we put together. Um, so similar to how Tim tracks the clients to see where they are at with um, implementing each of the EIPs, we're also experimenting with this tracker for libraries and tooling. So uh, if you go to that, um, that link I just put in the chat, your project should be listed somewhere there and then the intent is, you know, when you have something in project in progress, either DM me or make a PR to that uh, that document, and then update saying, "Oh, this is in progress," or uh, "We're done with it." And then it'll just give us an idea of where everybody's at. Um, so yeah, check out that link, and then Tim, uh, you can just take it away with whatever you'd like to start with. Cool. Thanks. Yeah, I think starting with the with the block header. Uh, it's probably the most important because, yeah, as I said, that'll change like the consensus. Um, to give just a quick background, uh, the original spec 1559 would change gas limit in the block header to gas target. Um, the way 1559 works is we want to target uh, a certain amount of gas, but we're fine going uh, up to 2x above that. So using numbers from the network today. Uh, you know, we want to target having 15 million gas, but we're actually going to enable having up to 30 million gas. And this is the way that we can get, kind of gauge uh, supply and demand for, for the network. Um, and uh, so the original uh, basically proposal in the EAP was to change gas limit, for, gas limit to gas target in the block header. Um, but as uh, we were implementing that and, and testing it, uh, we realized that breaks a bunch of things. Um, and so there was a, a proposal this week to kind of switch that uh, to instead use still the gas limit in the header. Um, but that means that on the fork block, we would have to bump the gas limit 2x. So it would basically go from, uh, you know, 50 million to 30 million, if that's, that's the numbers we're at. Um, but then at least the, uh, the field in the header would still return the maximum amount of gas that a block can, can consume. Um, I think Martin or Peter had written kind of the formal proposal for that. Uh, Light client wrote a, a PR to the to the EIP. 
Um, so I don't know if any of you have thoughts on it or anything you wanted to add. So I think the uh, one question that's outstanding for that is miners, when they set up to configure their nodes, they configure what gas limit they're going to target. And so every time they produce a block, they bump up or down towards their gas target. If a miner has the um, gas limit set via command line to 15 million, um, all of a sudden, as soon as the IP 1559 lands, they will start pushing the gas limit down because the block will have 30 million and their miner is configured to try to target 15 million. So we have a couple of options to address that. We can um, try to just communicate with miners and tell them, hey, you know, right at the fork block, you need to reconfigure your client. Uh, that kind of sucks because reconfiguring your client right at a fork block is dangerous and hard and whatnot. We can just accept that the block gas limit is going to be volatile for a bit around the fork, and that also kind of sucks. Um, the other option is to include like a second option uh, that you can add, which says, you know, while this option is present, gas limit is actually 2x what I set um, after the 1559 fork block. Um, and the last one is we can make it so that command line option does something different than it says. Um, so it says gas, gas limit, but really it's the gas target. Um, all these have disadvantages, of course. Uh, I'm personally partial to the second option that says, hey, just temporarily 2x this after the 1559 block, and then the user can remove that and it can be deleted from Geth later. Um, but that's that's the current thing that we need to address to move forward with this, I think. And I guess technically we, we don't have to address it. So each client can, direct, can address it separately. Um, since I think almost all miners run Geth, really this is a Geth problem. <laughs> Yeah, does anyone from the GET team have thoughts on that? Yeah, so um, personally, I think I would prefer just asking miners to please bump. So after the four classes, just bump the gas limits up a bit. And if, if we have a few blocks where the gas limit is going fluctuating a bit up and down, I mean, that's fine. Even if, it, even if it's half a day worth of fluctuating up and down, I don't think it's a problem. I personally don't really like these magical flags because first off we need to implement them, then we need to convince everybody to use them, and then when we delete them, we again need to convince everybody to meaningfully reconfigure. So it's, uh, I mean, we we either way need miners to do something, so might as well keep it simple and have them do the, the right thing from the get-go. For example, if uh, if we want to be nice and we don't want them to um, to screw with the gas limit during the fork, we can also tell them to, hey, just start start targeting 30 million two hours before the fork. And then, yeah, gas limit will go up a bit and then it will come down. So, so I think it, it's, I would personally just rely on miners to, to sort this out. So I can definitely try and communicate with miners and 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 uh, like see see if 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 they, they think that makes sense. Um, how I guess assuming so my fear is not that miners say that this doesn't make sense, but it's that there's not really a, an answer, uh, so we don't kind of hear back from them. Um, assuming we didn't hear back from miners and we kind of don't know what they'll do, um, would it be possible to add this? Yeah, I guess what's the latest we could add kind of a flag like this? How latest would be the fork release? Okay, so yeah, I'll follow up. Uh, I'll, I'll send an email and... Uh... But I so at least we do keep in touch with two mining pools or I won't discuss it, say keep in touch with we every couple months we maybe just exchange a message and they are generally i mean if we contact them that hey there's something screwing in get or there's something that you need to take care of they usually respond that's okay. also a problem that uh, they won't care but so as long as you can get the uh, the few larger pools to uh, yeah. play nicely with the gas target i mean properly set the stuff up the rest 
even if somebody misses it, they won't negatively influence the network. And, Got it. And, and you as a miner, if you're a small miner and you just misconfigured your node, you don't have access. There's absolutely no negative impact on you. So it's not like uh, we're being actively harmful to small miners who don't know about this. Okay, cool. So we can do that. Um, so I know, I think Light Client had a PR against the 1559 spec to, uh, to make this change. Um, does anyone object to this change? Last chance. Okay, so I guess we can go ahead and merge uh, your commit into the spec, uh, Light Client, and um, I'll update the London spec to reference that latest commit for 1559. Um, and that's probably what we'll use for the next uh, test net, so for, or the dev net for Baikal. And the way, uh, just to clarify, um, the way it is written now, it means that the at the fourth block, the previous blocks gas limit will be used as the as if it were the target of the parent block. So the new gas limit will immediately double. Is that correct? Or will it be a gradual mm, thing? That's fine. I know the current gas back says it will instantly double. Yes. I think that is good and expected behavior. Um, but yeah. well, that's essentially that if uh, the whole point of 1559 is to allow uh, twice as much gas. Yeah, yeah. That's kind of, um, I mean, that's the correct behavior in my opinion. Yeah. Okay, great. And uh, yeah, I'll make sure that we get an author of the EAP to approve the PR so it gets merged in. Uh, I'll try and ping them today. Anything else on the gas target versus gas limit? Okay, uh, so the next big topic was basically the renaming of the JSON RPC fields. Um, I know there were a lot of different threads on that. So there was the ETH research uh, thread originally, uh, then the get team put out a proposal this week um, to have basically shorter names and, and, and try to match the current uh, terminology with gas, gas limit, gas use and whatnot. Um, I'm not sure exactly where to start, but this one, it feels like there were various different threads on it. Um, yeah, maybe I guess because it's the most recent one, uh, yeah, I don't know if Martin or, or Peter, you want to walk us through what you had as a proposal. And I think uh, Micah and Light Client also had uh, yeah, comments on that. Uh, sorry, what proposal? Uh, for the JSON RPC naming. So basically, yeah. right now, yeah, I think the, the the fields were like max priority fee for gas, max fee for gas, yeah. um, and uh, I think Geth wanted to expose those as gas tip cap and gas fee cap, respectively. So, yeah, one thing that I think, uh, yeah, Peter can expand on it, but one thing that I really think we uh, reacted on is that it needs to be very clear for the user that something is per per unit of gas and not just uh, a lump sum uh, accumulated. So if you set uh, 20,000, you should know that this is 20,000 time, 20, times whatever gas you're gonna have. It's not like, uh, so we wanna, and I think that's the, that's the root thing that we want to be clear about. Uh, Peter, do you wanna expand? Mm, sure. So uh, essentially, the, this whole confusion came from uh, uh, from the implementation that uh, essentially Light Client implemented the IP1559 for us, and uh, it didn't really like, and I can share that sentiment, that really long uh, max priority fee per gas naming. 
And then he, he was suggesting we just go with uh, dip and uh, gas cap. Yeah, no, sorry, dip and P cap. And essentially, this is where this whole uh, misunderstanding stemmed from. And kind of, we kind of realized that this, uh, from a user's perspective, is super important to, to signal this that uh, some field is per gas and not, not a total. And the interesting thing was that the spec didn't uh, mention at all the, R, the JSON RPC aspects. So the the 1559 EIP focuses uh, fully on the consensus things and defining the variables and constants and algorithms and whatnot. But it absolutely did no mention on whatsoever on how these things will be named for the user. And uh, and essentially that's that was the reason why we wanted to bring it up because. When implementing it, it needs to be surfaced up to the user. Obviously, it needs to be in consensus across different clients because every wallet and everything needs to implement this. And uh, and then the question is, how do we name these uh, fields? Um, if we were to go with uh, just inherently what's in the EIP, then these fields would be named uh, max fee per gas and max priority fee per gas. These two names, I mean, they are, they are a correct description of what the fields do. But my problem is that currently the JSON RPC, when sending a transaction, there's a naming style. For example, we have gas limit, gas start, sorry. We have gas, gas limit, gas price, gas use. Uh, these are fields that currently the API sends and receives. And then it would be weird that, okay, we have gas price and we have max priority fee per gas, which is essentially almost the same thing. And then our suggestion was to uh, simply uh, call the tip, I mean, call the, this priority fee, we can call it uh, uh, gas tip cap or anything, if somebody has a better idea. And for the, for the base fee, which is actually paid by, I mean, the total, that the gas uh, that the transaction happened. So previously got gas price, and that would be kind of renamed to gas uh, fee cap. So it's um, it's just a slightly shorter version. You could also call it max fee per gas, or but that doesn't really fit in with the rest of the variable naming. And that is why we kind of suggested gas fee cap, and yeah, the tip was just something similar to the gas tip cap. But uh, all in all, the reason why we kind of brought it up, I don't really want to go into bike shedding because everybody has their feelings. Uh, the most important thing for me is that the spec actually states what the name of these API fields should be, because that's, that's the thing that we need to agree on. What is the status of the EIPs for the JSON RPC or for the JSON RPC spec? for the stuff. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. We had a list of separate EIPs for the different RP JSON RPC calls. Um, let me try and pull it up. Uh, 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 it's possible things got lost because JSON RPC spec is moving over to a different location. And so it's possible that just is there's confusion around that. Yeah, so we have like EIP, uh, EIP 3041, and I think there's like, 3044, um, well, these are all about the block. Let me see if there's some about, yeah. So these are all about the block. So I don't think we ever had an EIP, a JSON RPC EIP for the transaction fields. Um, so basically get transaction by block number and index, get transaction by hash and all that. Uh, we, we never drafted EIPs for those. Um, so I, I don't know, would that be the better spot to actually agree on those terms, like creating separate EIPs uh -huh. for the various JSON RPC calls, or do we want that in 1559 itself? I think it's kind of overkill to create a separate EIP just to name the fields. So I mean, in 1559, it's obvious that there are two fields that need to be exposed. We might as well just add them in 1559. So the um, we do need to specify, I think, the JSON RPC calls. Like there's a ongoing effort to specify all of the JSON RPC and get it um, in agree agreement between the clients. And so uh, 
for me, that feels like the right place to specify what the fields are. Um, the caveat being there that we are kind of in a in limbo for JSON RPC, and we don't currently have anything like officially or formally specified for JSON RPC, and so there's a good chance that such a specification, you know, might be a long pole here. And so I think uh, I can kind of appreciate where Peter's coming from that if we don't end up actually finishing a JSON RPC spec before London, then um, we're going to, people will gravitate towards using the names that are in the 1559 EIP just as like a reasonable default. And so if you don't like those names, then that's uh, need to be fixed there. Yeah, I, 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 th I agree with um, what Peter's saying. London. Um, and I think that we'll be in a better place. Um, sorry, apologies, um, Mika. Um, yeah, I, I think um, for, from our perspective, in terms of when it comes to implementing the JSON RPC uh, calls, it's it's certainly easier if everything's in one place. I, you know, within say um, the 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 original EIP, you have an explicit clause that calls out the JSON RPC changes. The risk, of course, with having separate JSON RPC. Um, uh, EIPs is that then you've got to link from the ones that affect the clients back to them and then they might not stay in sync whereas if someone's updating like a single EIP then you know you can just search for all occurrences of that that word there to make sure you're hitting all of them so I'd, I'd say it's going to keep things simpler as well in terms of keep keeping them in sync. So would it be so I guess, would you expect 1559 to have just the name of the fields as they will be returned in JSON RPC or like a full spec of the diff for every single RPC call that's changed by 1559, you know, like? Uh... No. no, so personally, I would be happy if there was a single paragraph saying that these two fields should be exposed as such and such on the API, and that's fine. Okay, so basically... So it doesn't need to be some conclusive spec. The idea is to just give a hint on, so that every client is on the same page on, on the naming convention. Got it. So we say we're adding base fee into the block. We're adding, uh, I forget what the agreed upon naming, but we're adding gas fee cap into the transaction and gas tip cap into the transaction, basically. Yeah, that would be. I think yeah. if somebody feels very strong about a different name, again, we can back shut this offline. I was just uh, the whole point is to just have the information somewhere. There was um one other uh, question that was being discussed, I think, which was so you you do have these two fields of the gas cap and the tip that the sender specifies, and there's a question of whether the JSON RPCs would expose the actual values chosen, like the actual fee paid and the, um, the actual tip paid or whether it would be up to clients to calculate them themselves. Mm, so I guess uh, this is similar to, um, to the gas use, used and gas uh, limit for transactions. So for example, if you retrieve a transaction, then the gas limit is not the amount of gas that was actually used, but it's the amount of gas the user specified. And I think you need to actually retrieve the receipts to get uh, the true gas usage. So maybe we could extend the receipts to, to include these fields. So the 1559 actually originally had uh, receipt changes, if I remember correctly. And then I think we took them out because we didn't want to include derived data in the receipt. Um, that being said, we can return additional information in the JSON RPC receipt request beyond what's actually in the receipt. And I think we already do that. Yeah, I mean, of course, that's, I, I didn't mean to change the consensus field because these obviously can be just calculated. So when you retrieve the receipt, you know which block it was in. So you have the base fee. And then if you have the base fee and have the, the, the limits that set by the transaction, you can just specify the bit that was used. So you don't need to store anything, it's just, about exposing it. I think the only argument against exposing it is that it would require two database series, one for the transaction, one for the block to calculate.
So uh, double, doubles uh, the cost. I have to read up on this a bit. I mean, I mean, um, check the code. But I think uh, Get already does uh, quite a number of uh, database reads when, for example, you retrieve a receipt because it doesn't store the receipts one by one, rather, we store them grouped by blocks. So, we added the way to actually to retrieve independent receipts. I don't know, it's, it's, I, okay. it's a good question, but I think this. So, the legitimate question is uh, are callers expected to have access to this? I would say probably yes. Because, for example, if you just look up your transaction on Etherscan, you probably want to know how much you paid for it. So, yeah. Um, I think people would expect this to be available somewhere. Yeah. And I guess, I don't know, we have a ton of projects here. So, is it quite valuable for? you all to have just the, the total fee paid right there in the JSON RPC, like, yeah. I see some people yes. nodding. <laughs> I would say so. Yeah, yeah, it's, okay. it definitely simplifies the code quite a bit. <laughs> okay, so I think if we can expose it, uh, we should at the client level. Um, and so, okay, and then there's a couple comments in the spec uh, about that, where the spec should live, uh, saying, you know, having a full diff would be good. Maybe if that's something we want to start the new kind of JSON RPC repo with, uh, that, that would be valuable. Um, so I think for sure we can commit, you know, to adding the, the fields, uh, the, the, the actual new fields in the 1559 spec, so that at least people know how to name them. Um, mm. So this gets into, uh, I'm trying to avoid bringing this up, but this conversation is rapidly driving us towards this. Uh, there's currently a dis disagreement on what should be in the IP's repo, and it's kind of coming to a head of notice in the last couple of weeks. We're seeing a lot more clashing between the editors and authors. Um, I'm hoping we don't need to resolve that before London, and so uh, <laughs> it'd be nice if we can find a solution that doesn't require us solving that problem. Yep, because I think it's going to be a big, a big debate. But just adding basically the name of the fields in the spec does that make sense? So the the, the thing that I'm against is having the one five five nine core EIP core EIP, the thing that defines the consensus changes, also include specifications related to interface changes, which is a whole other class of EIPs. Um, like we're, we're bleeding, the yeah, standard yeah. is very rapidly yeah. bleeding away from here's the consensus changes. Everything you need to know for a consensus client is right here into, oh, and also, you know, this is the command line parameters that we use in Geth and here's what parity does. And then like, this is a big yeah, can yeah. of worms that we need to solve. Um, I just, I'm, I don't want to get too distracted by that if we can avoid it is all. So I think... Does it make sense to, like Peter was suggesting, we add a single parameter in 1559 that says, you know, this is what the fields are called. And then we add the full diff of JSON RPC somewhere else. Uh, I see Peter, you have your hand up. Yeah, so I just want to say that from my perspective, it's totally fine to just have a link that from 1559 link to EIP, whatever, which defines all these information. But uh, my point really is that we are currently entering the point where we want to have a test net where all clients talk to each other. And um, I mean, if you want to test that, it would be nice if clients would also share the same APIs. So I mean, if somebody wants to do it over the weekend, great. But uh, if we have to wait for that spec one more month, then it kind of beats the purpose. So it's, it will be way too late. By that time. And I actually do agree with Peter on this. Like we need a, a solution, we need something relatively quickly. Um, and I mean, what may end up happening is just I back down and kind of give up for now and then reapproach the, the bigger fight later, um, just so we can move forward. Like, I don't want to hold up London or anything, um, on trying to figure out what is in the IP. So I think, yeah, at least if the fields are there, then we know all the clients will return like, yeah, you know, the same value, uh, in, in their in their implementation and, and that's probably pretty valuable with regards to like the full JSON RPC diffs. Um, 
you know, that's something we, we definitely should not put all in 1559. Um, and we can either open, you know, new heaps like we had already done for the base fee diffs uh, on the blocks, or we can add that directly in the ETH1 specs repo if, if you know, people prefer that. Um, I don't have a strong opinion there, but it feels like, yeah, that's probably too much to bring in 1559. Uh, I don't know, Peter, is your hand up again, or did you forget to lower it? Well, apologies. No, no worries. Um, and I saw somebody else put their hand up while I was speaking. Uh, yeah, if you have yeah, a comment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, if we are talking only about adding new fields, or is it uh, an option to remove a field? For example, uh, we talked about the gas price for the transaction. So, uh, if someone requires a transaction, legacy transaction, then he gets back like a five fields, for example. And if that transaction is now a 5059 transaction, does it need to get uh, to receive, sorry, uh, additional fields, but without the gas price? Is it something that will break uh, clients? Hmm. How much of a problem is it actually? Actually, I think you made just a brilliant point there. Uh, so when returning the receipt, uh, previously we mentioned that it might make sense to return the fees, the FIP and uh, the base fee paid. But uh, it might make sense to actually not return these two, simply use the gas price, which will be the actual fee paid in total. And if clients want to break it down, or for example, if they're scan, they can retrieve the base fee. But if they don't want to break it down, then the gas price will mean the same thing as it meant previously in the receipt, just the amount of money the user paid for it. And then no, uh, that infrastructure needs to be changed because it would receive the exact same field, which would may mean the exact same thing. Just it might not, so the transaction gas price and the receipt's gas price might not, I mean, the, the transaction wouldn't have a gas price anymore on the receipt. Martin, did you want to say something? No, I just wanted to say exactly that uh, because I interpreted the question being uh, if these new dynamic types do not have gas price, uh, which you just said they won't, then will that break tooling? Um, so it was tangential to what you said, but I don't think uh, you answered the question. Uh, uh, so, um, I guess tooling-wise, there's a um, backward compatibility thing. So, um, if you so any tool that currently exists can can still send uh, transactions using the gas price, and if you specify the gas price, then it will be interpreted as a legacy transaction where um, the gas price will be used as both the maximum fee permitted to be paid by a transaction and also the maximum fee. So it's uh, essentially there's a little trick in 1559 so that uh, all, all, all currently existing tooling will continue to function perfectly without needing an upgrade whatsoever. And of course, if you want to- Well, not, yeah, not, for something that, not for something that relies on fetching uh, transactions over RPC and parsing the, the gas price and doing something clever with it. Those will not work. Yeah, yeah. So if so, the only thing that would, would change if you were to retrieve a new type of transaction. So if you retrieve a fifteen fifty nine transaction, then yes, that one will have the fee cap, fee cap and the fee and separate fields, and won't have the gas price. So that is a slightly breaking change. But apart from that, I think most other API endpoints would remain stable or at least backwards compatible. Quick question. Uh, since we are introducing different types, uh, well, it was introduced uh, in the previous uh, release, different types of transactions. And we is putting now transaction two, um, type two. Uh, are there any plans or are we thinking this is a good time to put, you know, to enable having the capability to have transaction type three. And so mainly 
we all the JSON RPCs should be able to uh, be able to return the transaction type and the, all the information in a generic way. So later on, when we decide to change something else, uh, will it make it much easier? So that way, all the tooling that we are creating, maybe like recovering signatures or whatever, building RLPs and, and, and so on, using the uh, JSON RPC information will allow us to, uh, yeah, just plug in other uh, types of transactions as well. And um, uh, yeah, but uh, uh, the, in the chats, I think the, R, the RPC returns transaction type, yeah, but as, as we're going to introduce more fields and more information, if we can think about a way to do this, uh, yeah, uh, from Mike as well, yeah, he doesn't envelope it exactly. So if we create some kind of a generic abstract wrapper for, for this, for the JSON RPC, maybe it would be a good time to, to do so. Um, yeah, uh, yes, from uh, agreeing to Mike in the chat. <laughs> if you were, uh, you, Mike, I don't know if you want to just uh, chip in in the conversation, please, because <laughs> I'm going to be reading your answers. But... So I think what uh, Juan is getting at here is the we have a new transaction type, and it looks very similar to the previous transaction type. Similar to access list looked very similar to legacy transactions. And so, so far, we've been able to get away with just kind of adding fields here and there. But as we get more transaction types in the future, it's very likely they're going to diverge more and more. And so rather than trying to just kind of keep hacking little bits and pieces on, at some point, we're going to need to make a transition to, you know, transactions can be very different. And we need like an envelope or some, uh, some mechanism for dealing with transactions that are widely divergent, like maybe using different signature types, different encoding types, stuff like that. And so is now the right time to uh, make that cut over to having some sort of enveloping system or some sort of typing system? Or do we want to, for now, continue to just add on a couple of fields because we can, and then we'll kick that count down the road and solve the enveloping later? My personal preference is to kick the can, but uh, not because I don't really want to solve this problem. Rather, I don't think we know what we want to envelope properly. So as long as the transactions are kind of almost the same, it's super hard to create an abstract envelope that will properly really be useful. So I would suggest let's wait until we have a transaction type that's, that really needs it, and then we can figure out some enveloping where it's actually suitable for, for those needs. Also, it won't delay London, so that's a big one. Yeah, true. So I think that's like mostly what we had already on the agenda. Um, I guess the one thing we still haven't figured out is where do we track the full JSON RPC diffs? Um, that is kind of a can of worms. So um, yeah, I, I want to see, is there anything else that like, especially from the tool in your infrastructure side, you all wanted to bring up? Uh, and I think that's kind of higher priority to discuss on the call and we can figure out the, yeah, the JSON RPC uh, uh, diff elsewhere. Yeah. So uh, how does that backwards come Compatibility is supposed to work if we uh, like at certain block the uh, mm, transaction uh, format changes. So what happens when the old the app sends transactions in the old format? Is that specified? Uh, the old transactions, so legacy transactions, will still be accepted by the network um, even after the London hard fork. So from that point of view, you can still send them, you can still gossip them, etc. The only thing that will change is like if a tool doesn't do anything then it just means you will not be able to properly um, kind of parse and handle new transactions that show up in a block. Um, so otherwise, you can still function fully. So you can send in the legacy transaction, you can get it, it's, get it by transaction hash, you can get its receipt, and all those things will look the same for you. Um, so, so really, from a tooling standpoint, I don't think there's anything that absolutely must 
be changed with London. Uh, someone correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think it should be fully backwards compatible. And does the old gas uh, calculation translate somehow to a new model then? Yeah, so the way it translates is just we take the gas price that you supply in the legacy transaction, and we use that both as the priority fee cap and the max cap. So um, which, which the, the way it works is it's basically kind of a, a, a sum of the two, or I'm sorry, a max of the two. And so um, we can kind of transform it, and you won't benefit from any of the benefits of EIP-1559. So you won't get that the nice new auction format. Uh, but it will work. Like it will still be mined. You'll basically function just like a legacy transaction in that situation. So your users don't benefit, but it still works. And then about the envelope and gas, do you perceive that there might be in the future different transaction types with different kind of gas configurations? So there would be like legacy gas, new gas, and then something even different than that? Is that so far, we've been able to always maintain like legacy transactions continue to work. And I don't think we have anything on the docket for the future that will cause legacy transactions to stop working. Um, all the new transaction types that have been talked about and proposed are additive. So it'll be a new type of transaction, um, which you will be able to send in addition, like or alternatively to the legacy transactions, but the legacy transactions will still work. Does that answer your question or did I misunderstand? Uh, so maybe uh, let me rephrase it a little bit. Is there a chance that there's going to be a, it, it, does the gas parameter should go into envelope or into transaction itself? Uh, I see. So I think this is what Peter was getting at is that we're not quite sure enough on what future transactions will look like to know whether they're all going to have the same like gas limit mechanics or not. Like for example, account abstraction. Um, changes a lot of assumptions and some of those assumptions may change kind of how gas works maybe um, in a future transaction and so i think that's why peter was arguing um, for good reason that we should be careful about building an envelope today because we don't yet know what the right bounds of that envelope are makes sense thank you very helpful yeah just wanted to add one thing that although uh, i think we do uh, um, there's no immediate rush to get rid of legacy transactions, meaning that probably in the foreseeable few years, legacy transactions will continue to work. But I do think long term, there will be a push to phase out these legacy transactions. And by these legacy transactions, meaning that from 1559 onward, both the current legacy transactions and also non-1559 accesses transactions would probably be phased out eventually. So there's not really no reason to keep that complexity forever. But yeah, that's probably not in the next couple of years either. Cool. Uh I see, uh, Joachim, you had a comment in the chat about send signed transaction. This caused problems on the previous DevNets. Um, so basically, how do we specify it? Uh, and legacy transactions were sent as serialized transactions, but for 2930-1559, you had to RLP encode the serialized transaction. Um, I think that's something we discussed when we were planning Berlin, that we would just do that. and it, was not great, but uh, af after long debates, we kind of agreed to that. But I don't know if somebody has like a better memory of this than I, I do. Well, currently, uh, B2 and Nevermind have actually changed uh, that they are not uh, ROP encoding these transactions anymore. So I think it will be very nice to just get a consensus on this because otherwise, you can't send these transactions uh, when we fork. Yeah, on, on BASU, we're actually handling both, or we're accepting both, uh, at least from the send raw transaction endpoint. So we didn't, you know, we don't know what side of the fence this is going to land on. So we're we're uh, properly handling both. Okay, great, nice. Out of curiosity, what do you do to detect which one it is? 
Um, we look at the, the first byte to see if it is uh, 7F or less. And if it is, then we try to decode it as a uh, type transaction. And otherwise, we go back to the legacy parsing. Gotcha. So was the issue with like a specific client then? Like what, so if Basu and Nethermind seem to support both formats, was it just because you tried to like send a transaction through GET and GET is implementing it direct differently or? No, I just contacted uh, them like, okay, you can send these transactions. And then they said, they said you should probably RP encode it. And then I send it, but I thought, yeah, um, we should get a bit of consensus on this because otherwise, uh, if you use this Web3 stuff and you want to send these transactions, then you can do it because uh, some clients might uh, um, force you to send ROP uh, uh, encoded, uh, so do basically doubly uh, ROP encoded transactions over RPC, and other clients would not. But I think like how Bizu uh, solved it at, at this point is like very nice, and we can agree later like what the actual consensus should be. So that's that's fine too. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of agree that it makes sense to, but this is again, uh, I would say, uh, this is a, a nice little EIP from Micah, just stating uh, that the standard transaction endpoint must accept this and this and this transaction in these and these formats. But I think if, uh, for example, if there's a, a tried and working way to do it, and the, some clients don't support it, for example, I have no idea whether GET supports it or not. I think it's perfectly fine to open a feature request and add it because it's completely reasonable in my opinion. Is anyone here um, strongly wants to RLP encode that uh, an extra time? Or is everybody either ambivalent or in favor of not RLP encoding it? It would be nice to be specific that way, you know, it's not ambiguous in the future. Yeah, yeah I'm just wondering if there's anyone arguing on the other side of the fence or not. Yeah, I would argue that Sandro uh, should take the binary form of a transaction, whatever that may be, which in the case of new transactions is not a repeat. Anyone disagree with that? I agree with Martin. Sounds like consensus. No, sounds like consensus. Yeah, it sounds like consensus to me. <laughs> consensus via silence. Uh, Tim stepped away for a second, but I just want to give a quick plug for the ETH R&D Discord. If you haven't joined there, that's where a lot of this discussion is happening um, through a couple different channels. There's one specifically related to 1559. And then there's, you know, the general awkward devs channel. So if you're not already in there, uh, I would strongly encourage you to at least check it uh, once a week and get up to speed on, on where discussions are heading. Um, it's definitely gonna, gonna help you as we move towards London in these next few weeks, you know, getting block numbers out and stuff like that. It'll just help you stay in touch with where things are headed. Oh, Tim's back. Yes, apologies about that. So where's the best place to document the RLP decision? Uh, yeah. The non-existent JSON spec. <laughs> okay. We really need to get JSON specs. Uh, yes. Um, so, so that's one thing. Uh, if anybody on this call wants to help with a JSON spec and has the bandwidth, we definitely have funds to pay for that. Um, if somebody wants to help, you know, from the, like, yeah, so if, it feels like for a lot of people on this call, time is the bigger issue than money. Uh, but if you do have the skills uh, and you know money is the bigger issue, uh, please ping me and we can definitely uh, get this going. Um, yeah, and, and ideally, if it was somebody that's kind of adjacent to the client devs, I think that would help because there's a ton of work to do on the actual consensus bits before London. Uh, so I suspect if we rely on like Geth or uh, Nethermind or Beisu, uh, we might not get the specs in time. So I'll be 
both reaching out to folks and accepting inbound uh, for anyone who wants to help try to spec the JSON RPC diff. Uh, we can probably get somebody, you know, one of the core devs to just add the quick paragraph to 1559 about the para parameter naming. And then whoever works on the diff can, uh, you know, use that as a reference. Um, yeah, but I'll be, I'll be, I'll be uh, uh, following up on that right after this call. Um, so we only have eight minutes left. Was there any other topic that anyone on the infrastructure side wanted to bring up? Uh, fork timelines, a uh, comment from EG. Uh, the challenge this time around is the difficulty bomb. Uh, so we don't really have a ton of leeway with regards to the fork timeline, at least for mainnet. Um, you know, test nets can come basically whenever before mainnet, but mid-July is kind of when we have to fork on mainnet. Um, so this is kind of the main uh, constraint here. Um, and realistically, we probably want, you know, the last kind of tested fork to be at least two, three weeks before that. So if you have like late June for the last testnet fork, um, yeah, I have an actual doc with, with dates, uh, but I think it was like, yeah, July 14th was mainnet. Uh, July, let me, let me try to find the timing doc. July 14th was mainnet. Um, June 30th was the last testnet. Uh, oh, sorry, no, June 23rd was the last test net. And then the first test net would be June 9th, um, which is kind of a month from now. Uh, this is what I had. I see EG has put a spreadsheet uh, there. Oh yeah, so that's basically my spreadsheet. So I'm, yeah, the blocks, uh, yeah, the blocks may or may not be accurate, but I think this is basically, a, you know, at least at the week level accurate for if we did want to, if we want to have a mainnet fork on July 13th and have a fair amount of testing or of time on the test nets before that, um, if the first fork date is the biggest issue, um, you know, we can either have like less time between the last test net fork and mainnet. Uh, we can maybe have more of the test net forking at the same time, which is not great. Um, yeah. So that's kind of where we're at. Yeah. I don't know if anyone else has thoughts, comments on this, aside that it's a very tight timeline. Um, yeah, I don't have comments on that specifically, but regarding Baikal. Yes. Um, I don't know how the other clients, uh, how close they are. As for Geth, uh, I think the, we could basically spin up by call immediately if we really want to. Um, and so maybe we can get it started during the weekend. Basically, was close. We have uh, we have the the configs, the four configs in there, but I think we still have one at least one of the necessary EAPs still outstanding. So we're close, but not there yet. Yeah. Did uh, oh, and we didn't really mention it, but so Vitalik just merged light clients uh, changed to fifteen fifty nine, um, and I merged light clients PR to modify fifteen fifty nine. So the Guess by call implementation of 1559 is the, the new one with the, the unambiguous header uh, gas limit. And Does that so, have behavior at the transition already, or is that just something that would happen when we're doing subsequent testing? Sorry, what the behavior? The, the uh, 2x at the transition. Like client, correct me if I'm wrong, but I would say yes. I need to look in, at it again, hold on. If I recall correctly, we just take the previous gas limit and interpret it as the target, as if it were the target. Uh, the previous That's what the spec says. 
Okay. I thought there was, um, thought there was still some conversation about that earlier about whether that was going to be, um, I'm sorry, I was dealing with a kid in the morning, so I was mostly only auditing earlier, but um, we we're still talking about whether it was going to be option one, two, three, or four about how we're going to treat this limit and gas target at the transition. Yeah, I believe everybody, we came to consensus that we will have a, um, on the fork block, you will, the parent gas target will be equal to the parent gas limit. Okay. And for everything else, um, it's as it was before, basically. Uh, sorry, not, not as it was before. And for everything, for every block after that, the parent gas limit is the parent gas limit. So um, target is half of that. Um, there is one issue that, sorry, I didn't get it on the agenda. I forgot. Um, currently, all clients uh, implemented something differently than the spec. So either we need to fix the spec or we need to fix all the clients. Um, does anyone remember, Light Client, do you remember what that was? I think um, everybody right now is is setting the, ba the default, the, oh, uh, right, the base. initial base fee at the fork block. And I think the spec technically says that you should treat blocks before the fork block to have the initial base fee. So technically yes. on the fork block, we should have calculated a base fee, but at the moment, all clients just use default base fee for that. So yeah, so, so right now um, we, we need to either fix the spec or we need to fix the clients. I, I'm weakly in favor of fixing the clients because I think the code complexity to doing what the spec says is lower, um, but I will acknowledge that the code complexity difference is fairly mild. I would rather keep it as is. I don't think it's functionally yeah. any different. And I don't think that it is going to simplify things much. It does feel, so it means that the clients would set a base fee in the block before the fork on the spec? Uh, no, so what, it, uh, this is, what the spec says is that when you are on the EIP 15594 fork block, you treat the parent block as though it had a base Got fee it. of X, where X Got is something. Um, the clients, what they implemented is, is when you're on the fork block, you just set the base fee to some hard-coded value. I mean, I think they're both basically the same. It's just, do you set the base fee one block before or the fork block? And I think the and fork block is actually a little bit simpler. Well, I would kind of agree because if you set the base fee on the parent block, well, the, the base fee of the fork block then would depend on how full the parent block is, but the parent block doesn't yet have this gas target gas limit differentiation. So it's it's a bit weird. So I would, yeah, yeah, agreed. So I kind of so, agree that let's, let's do 1559 when the fork hits and let's try to backport some concepts into the parent. So that means we need a PR to the spec to also change that, but that wouldn't change anything in the client implementations, right? Um, does anyone want to volunteer a PR to the spec that updates this? Sounds like you have to pick somebody. Um, I can do it. Okay, thanks, Art. Um, cool, and uh, we're at time, but I just had a final question about Baikal. Um, it seemed in the chat that uh, Basu uh, had one missing, Open Ethereum was missing refunds, Nethermind was missing refunds. Does that mean people have the other EAP, uh, which was uh, 3541, like the uh, basically disabling uh, the contracts being deployed with the starting bytecode? Um, yes, yes. I said the inverse for Basu, I believe. I think we have uh, the uh, refunds disabled and don't uh, fight. And then also we need to implement the, uh, the changes for uh, 1559. Got it. Uh, open Ethereum, Nethermind? Oh, 
Sorry, I didn't, I didn't fully understand the question. Yeah. So do Open Ethereum and Nethermind have EIP 3541 for Baikal or not? Just yeah, I just want to make sure. Um, Uh, we don't have uh, reduction uh, in refunds, refunds reduction, sorry, already. But we start work, work on it. Okay, got it. Uh, I don't want. Um, I don't want to keep people too long. Yeah. Um, uh, I just wanted wanted to say really quick. Um, so this this call itself was um, seemed it it was pretty in depth or in the weeds on on JSON RPC stuff. Um, so thank you for you know libraries who libraries and tooling that joined and maybe didn't have a direct contribution, but it's probably still valuable to listen in and, and see where the changes are headed. Um, in the future, we'll probably have more of a stand up type thing where clients and and libraries can just give their brief updates. Um, so apologies if we didn't get to that part, but in the future, we can probably arrange something more like that. And then that leads to the next question, which is uh, when sh or if should 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 we have a next call? Um, I, we hadn't assumed this would be a recurring thing, but it seems like this was a really productive discussion. So um, I'm curious, Tim, what do you think in two weeks, three weeks after the fourth block is set, what is your intuition? So it feels like we have a lot of stuff to do, you know, both on the client implementation side, the JSON RPC spec side. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm cautious of like imposing another meeting on yeah, everybody yeah. two weeks so, yeah, from now. I, 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 yeah, I should have also said like, we don't need to set it right now as well. That's yeah. really fine. So let's see. Yeah, I guess my preferred option would be see on all core devs next week where we're at and if we mm -hmm. feel like this is necessary. Um, I think in the meantime, you know, if folks have like specific issues or concerns that come up, uh, raising them either on the Discord or on ETH Magicians is really good and we can kind of, uh, you know, it, it'll help get a feel for how many issues we actually have and, and whether we need a separate, a separate call for them or if we can deal with some of them in all core devs next week. Awesome. Yeah, and then I'll just point everybody back to that tracker. Um, so if if you do have an update or work that's started. Um, I know things are a little still up in the air, but once you do start that work, like the JavaScript team has, I know they've started some things, um, just pull a PR to that and, um, or DM me and I can update it for you. That would be a great help. Cool. Any, any yeah. final things? Was this helpful for folks on the non-core dev side? Came away with a lot of things to go research after the call. So yeah. That's a good outcome. <laughs> it's nice to have everyone brought together for this. I think cool. uh, yeah, the, 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 live, the client library teams don't tend to speak that much to one another. So I think this is definitely helpful. Awesome. Um, okay, well, yeah, thanks everybody. See so, ya, yeah, thanks for attending. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.